Hello and welcome. I'm Lynn Fries, producer of Global Political Economy, or GBE News Docs. Today, I'm joined by Nick Buxton. He's going to be giving us some big picture context on the Great Reset, a World Economic Forum initiative to reset the world system of global governance. A worldwide movement crossing not only borders, but all walks of life, from peasant farmers to techies, is fighting against this initiative on the grounds that it represents a major threat to democracy. Key voices from the health, food, education, indigenous people, and high-tech movements explained why in the Great Takeover, how we fight the Davos capture of global governance a recent webinar hosted by the Transnational Institute. Today's guest, Nick Buxton, is a publications editor and Future Labs coordinator at the Transnational Institute. He's the founder and chief editor of TNI's flagship State of Power report. Welcome, Nick. Thank you very much, Lim. Nick, the Transnational Institute was, was co-organizer of the Great Takeover webinar. So what is it that you're mobilizing against uh, in opposing this Great Reset initiative? What we're really concerned about is that this initiative by the World Economic Forum actually looks to entrench the power of those most responsible for the crises we're facing. Um, and in, in, in many ways, it's a trick. It's a sleight of hand. Uh, to make sure that things continue as they are, to continue the same, um, that will create more of these crises, more of these pandemics, will deepen the climate crisis, which will deepen inequality. Um, it's not a great reset at all. It's a great corporate takeover. And that's what we were trying to draw attention to. What we've been finding in, in recent years is that um, really there is something, I would call it a kind of a global silent coup d'etat going on in terms of global governance. Most people don't see it. And people are familiar, have become familiar with the way that corporations are, have far more influence and are being integrated into policymaking at a national level. Uh, they see that more, more in front of them. People see their services being privatized. Um, they see uh, the influence of the oil companies or the banking sector that has stopped um, actions such as regulations of banks or a dealing with a climate crisis. What people don't realize is that at a global level, uh, there has been something much more silent going on, which is that their governance, which used to be by nations, is now increasingly be done by unaccountable bodies dominated by corporations. Um, and part of the problem is that that has been happening in lots of different sectors, but people haven't been connecting the dots. So what we've been trying to do in the last year is to talk with people in the health movement, for example, people involved in public education, people involved um, in food sector to say what, what is happening in your sector. And what we found is that in each of these sectors, global decisions were used to be discussed by bodies such as the WHO or such as the Food and Agriculture Organization were increasingly done by these these unaccountable bodies. Um, just to give an example, uh, we have now the global pandemic and one of the key bodies that is now making the decision is, is, is a facility called COVAX. You'd have thought global health should be run by the World Health Organization. It's accountable to the United Nations. It has a, a system of accountability. Well, what's actually happening is that World Health Organization is just one of a few partners, but really it's been controlled by corporations and corporate interests. In this case, it's Gavi and CEPI, uh, and they are both bodies which, which don't have a system of accountability, uh, where it's not clear who chose them, who they're accountable to, or how they can be held to account. Um, and what we do see is that there's a lot of corporate influence in each of these bodies. What this webinar was about was bringing all these sectors together who were seeing this silent coup d'etat going on in their own sector to map it out. And so one of the things that you'll have seen in the, in the webinar is, is this mapping of the different sectors who are, um, who are seeing this going on. And the idea is just to give a global picture that this is something happening. We've had... We've had more than a hundred of these um, of these multi, multi-stakeholder bodies uh, coming to coming to the fore 
in, in the last 20 years. Um, and, and there's been very little kind of taking note of that and taking stock of what's emerging. And what's emerging is this silent global coup d'etat. So what you find then in the big picture that you're getting is that a global coup d'etat has been silently emerging. And at the heart of it is a move towards multi-stakeholder model of global governance. And that this is the model that's the path and mechanism of a corporate hijack of global and national governance structures. And the World Economic Forum agenda fits into all this as the WEF, of course, is one of the world's most powerful multi-stakeholder institutions. So, Nick, in explaining what all this means, let's start with some of your thoughts on the history uh, of how we got here. I think what we had was in the 90s was the kind of height of neoliberalism. We had we had um, the increasing role of corporations as and the deregulation of the state. Uh, and it really started to come through in 2000 with the Global Compact, um, where the UN invited in uh, you know, corporations. And the idea was that we're going to need to involve corporations, one, because uh, we will need private finance became the kind of motto, the, the mantra. So we need to involve corporations. They can be part of the solution. So it was far, partly finance. It was partly the withdrawal of state uh, from kind of global cooperation. Um, and, and that started to invite corporations into the global governance, where corporations were increasingly um, being invited into these kind of bodies. That dovetailed with this whole movement um, called the corporate social responsibility, that said corporations weren't just profit-making vehicles, they could be socially responsible actors. Um, and, and so increasingly corporations were pitching themselves as, as not just um, corporate entities, but as global citizens. Um, and, and one of the key vehicles for that, of course, was the World Economic Forum, which has really been articulating through Klaus Schwab and through their whole, and through their whole work, uh, this idea that's, that corporations uh, sh should firstly be social responsible, and secondly, as part of that, they should be treated as social entities and should be in integrated into governance and decision-making. That we needed to move from what was considered a kind of antiquated state-led um, multilateral approach to a much more agile governance system. And this is again, the kind of mantra of coming in of the private sector being efficient, that the private sector, if you involve them in decision-making, you would get more faster decisions, you get agile decisions, you'd get better decisions. Um, so this all really came together. Um, and and in, in some ways, it's even being consolidated even further. The irony is that as, as you've had nationalist governments come to power, the, the kind of Trump America firsts of the world or Modi India first, they articulate a nationalist agenda, but they haven't actually questioned the role of corporations in any way whatsoever. And as, as they've retreated from multilateral forums like the United Nations, they've left a vacuum that corporations have been able to fill. Corporations now say, we can be the global actors, we can be the responsible actors, we're the ones who can sort to tackle the big crises we face, such as inequality, such as climate change, um, such as the pandemic. Um, so, so really, this, this, we've had this convergence of forces coming together, where as states have retreated, um, corporations have filled the vacuum. You mentioned earlier that the World Economic Forum was one of the key vehicles for these ideas. And the WEF also went big in filling that vacuum that you're talking about. TNI reported the WEF Global Redesign Initiative, uh, stretching back to 2009, created something like 40 global agenda councils and industry sector bodies. So in the sphere of global governance, the WEF created space for corporate actors across the whole spectrum of governance issues from cybersecurity to climate change, you name it. So yeah, the Global Redesign Initiative was one of the first initiatives that the World Economic Forum launched in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, and their idea was that we needed to replace what was uh, an inefficient um, multilateral system that was not able to solve problems with a new form of things. So they were saying, instead of a multilateral where nations make decisions in global cooperation, we needed a multi-stakeholder approach, which would bring together 
all the interested parties uh, in small groups to make decisions. And the Global Redesign Initiative was really a model of that. They were trying to say, okay, how do we resolve um, issues such as the governance of the digital economy? Um, and their answer to it is we bring the big tech companies together, we bring the governments together, and we bring a few civil society players, and we'll work out a system that makes, that makes sense. Um, and, and so you had a similar thing going on in all these other redesign councils, really their models for how they think governments should be done. And some of them have not just become models, they've actually become the real thing. So many of the multi-stakeholder initiatives we've seen emerge today have emerged um, out of some of these councils. Um, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, one of the key ones leading COVAX right now, the response to the pandemic, was launched at the World Economic Forum. So the World Economic Forum is now becoming a launch pad for many of these multi-stakeholder bodies. We should also note the World Economic Forum is a very well-funded launch pad. As a PowerPoint from the Great Takeover webinar put it, corporations do not pay tax but donate to multi-stakeholder institutions. And the WEF, of course, is funded by powerful corporations and business leaders. Uh, the PowerPoint also noted the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is one of the main funders of multi-stakeholder institutions. In contrast, multilateral institutions are being defunded on the back of falling corporate tax revenues uh, for nation states. Given uh, it depends on government donors, the UN regular budget, that's the backbone of funding for the one country, one vote multilateral processes of intergovernmental cooperation and decision making, has taken a big hit. Perhaps you could comment on some big picture implications on this kind of changing dynamic that's going on between corporate actors and nation states. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think what we're seeing is that they, um, as gradually the corporations have become more powerful, um, they, they have weakened the capacity of the state. So they have reduced the tax basis. You know, most corporations have seen corporate tax rates dr fall dramatically and even more trillions are now siphoned away in tax havens. So the, the entire corporate tax base, which used to play a much bigger role in state funding has reduced. Um, at the same time, they, they, their influence over policies which benefit corporations has increased. So they're reducing the regulations that were on them. They're reducing all the costs that used to be opposed on, on the thing. So you've had a weakening of the state and the strengthening of corporations. And, and what's happened at a global governance level is that they have also moved not just from influencing dramatically through their power, their economic power, political decision making, but in an easy global governance thing, it's the next step forward because they're not just saying that we want to be considered and we will lobby to have our position heard. They're saying we want to actually be part of the decision-making bodies themselves. Um, and the classic again is, is if we look at the pandemic with COVAX is that um, what I looked actually at just at the board of Gavi, the, the Global Alliance on Vaccines. Um, if you look at the body, it's the board is dominated, firstly, by big pharmaceutical companies. Um, secondly, you have some nations and some and civil society representatives, but you have far more, interestingly, almost a, a large number of the board are financiers. They come from the finance sector. They come from big banks. Um, so they're, they're, I don't know what they have to do with public health, um, and WHO is just one of the players. So it's, it's suddenly overcrowded by others who have no um, public health representation. Uh, they've been dominated by finance and pharmaceutical companies starting to really shape and guide um, decision-making. And, and on the finance side, of course, Bill and Gates Foundation has, is now the big player in many of these things. And it's, it's, it's not just donating, it's also involved now in shaping policy. So those who give money um, uh, in a philanthropic way, no matter how they earn that money or no matter what their remit is and who they're accountable to, they're only accountable to, the, to, to Bill and Melinda Gates, um, ultimately, are now part of the decision-making process as well. And, and this has become so normalized that there seems to be very little question of it. Um, we will bring together these players. Now, who chose them? 
who who chose this body to come to go? Who's it accountable to? There was a British parliamentarian called Tony Benn. He says, if you want to understand democracy, you need to ask five questions. Um, uh, wh what, what power do you have? Who did you get it from? Whose interests do you serve? To whom are you accountable? And how can we get rid of you? If you look at a body like, such as COVAX, um, who, who, where did they get the power from? They just self-convened. They just brought together a group of powerful actors. They will make a token effort to involve one or two civil society representatives. But the power very much lies with, with the corporations and, and with the financiers, those who are financing it. Um, and it's not accountable. They chose their body. Uh, it, the interests are very clear who it serves. It, clear, it serves the pharmaceutical companies. They will, of course, do certain things um, within the remit, um, but ultimately they will not undermine their business model, even if that business model is getting in the way of a, an effective response to the pandemic. We can't get rid of them because we never chose them in the first place. So it fails really the very fundamental principles of democracy. And yet it's now been normalized that this is the way that global governance should happen. Nick, comment briefly on an agreement that was quite a milestone in this process of normalization of multi-stakeholderism as the way global governance should happen. I'm thinking of the uh, strategic partnership agreement signed by the Office of the UN Secretary General with the World Economic Forum in 2019. So, What's some background in your response to that uh, UNWEF agreement? Well, the World Economic Forum has been um, advocating this mod model of multi-stakeholder capitalism to replace multilateralism for a long time. Um, and, and they have been um, gradually, I would say, kind of setting up parallel bodies, these multi-stakeholder bodies to make decisions um, on major issues of global governance, whether it's the digital economy or whether it's how to respond to a, a, a pandemic. Um, and, and so they've, they've been advancing this model um, alongside the UN for some time. But what, what was really concerning to us is that they're starting um, to um, increasingly um, uh, engage with the UN and start to impose this and start to push this model within the United Nations. Um, and the classic example was this strategic partnership, which was signed in, I believe, June of 2019. I don't think it went even in front of the General Assembly, so it wasn't discussed amongst the members. It was a decision by the Secretariat of the UN, without any, at least any formal systems of accountability, to sign a deal with the World Economic Forum that would essentially in start to involve you. World Economic Forum staff within the departments of the UN. They would become so-called kind of whisper advisors. The, the, the World Economic Forum would start to have its staff mingling with UN staff and starting to make decisions. Um, and there was no system of accountability. There was no system of, of, um, of consulting more widely. And, and we know the World Economic Forum is, is a business forum. If you look at its board, it's completely controlled. Uh, by, by some of the most wealthy and powerful corporations. And many of those corporations are responsible for many of the crises we face. And yet here they were being open, open armed, uh, welcomed into the United Nations to play a very significant role. And, it, and we, we, we protested that. We said that this is, not, this is not a way to solve global problems, to involve those who are actually responsible for the crises to resolve it will only lead to solutions that are either ineffective or actually deepen the crises we face. Um, we understand why the UN is doing it. It's because of this lack of national support. It's because of the defunding. They're looking to kind of survive as an organization and they're going to the most powerful players in the world, which are the corporations. But what they're gonna end up doing is ult as ultimately undermining the United Nations. It will actually damage the United Nations because it will remove all the democratic legitimacy that it currently has. Um, we desperately need global collaboration and cooperation, um, but it must be based on public and democratic systems of governance, not um, unaccountable, secretive forms of governance dominated by corporations. So that's pretty clear. You oppose multi-stakeholderism because it's an unaccountable, secretive form of governance dominated by corporations. So as well as being unaccountable, the multi-stakeholder model is a voluntary 
and a market-based approach to problem solving. Comment on how that also uh, fits into why you oppose the multi-stakeholderism. Yeah, the, the, the solutions they're looking for are voluntaristic, where you can come in or out, and they're market-based. So they will never actually challenge the business model as it is. Ultimately, what happens is that they make decisions which are not binding and actually force actors like corporations to do certain things. They're based entirely on this voluntary meth model, um, but it's a kind of the take it or leave it governance where you can do things that, you, that look good for your, for your annual report, but don't actually uh, change the way you actually operate. Um, and so ultimately they won't resolve the crises that we're facing. So it's not just that they're unaccountable, but they're ultimately very ineffective. So if we look at the climate crisis, for example, we'll say the only way that we can deal with the climate crisis is market solutions. Even if we know that really the scale of the climate crisis, the urgency and the timing requires us to take much more drastic solutions, which will be state led, which will require corporations to reduce emissions um, that will start to transform economies. Um, that will have to be taken, these kind of public decisions. Uh, we're, we're ignoring that entirely for a model which is based on kind of market incentives, which really do nothing to change the business model that has created the climate crisis. Okay, so that goes a long way in explaining why you say the World Economic Forum Great Reset Initiative is no reset at all. Nick, briefly touch on some of your further observations. Like, why is the multi-stakeholder model is based on market solutions? When push comes to shove, uh, the profit motive will always win out under this approach to global governance. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, corporations will accept market solutions, which give them the power to, uh, to really control the pace of change. And so you'll see it. They're, they're very happy to, to produce these corporate social responsibility reports, but they will fight tooth and nail for any regulation which actually enforces social environmental goals. Um, so, and they will fight on the, an international level to have trade rules to actually prevent states imposing social environmental goals. So, so there's very much an approach where they're willing to have greenwash, they're willing to have the propaganda around social environmental goals, but they will absolutely oppose and in, in any rules would actually control their, their environmental and social impacts. They do not want anything which actually requires regulation and, and impacts which will actually force them to do certain changes. They want their changes to be very much ones that they control and which they shape and ultimately that they can ditch at the moment it starts to challenge the profits that they want to make. Let's turn now to the coalition in, in fighting for a democratic reset on uh, global governance. So a future where decision-making over the governance of global commons, like, uh, for example, food, water, health, and the internet, is, is done in the public interest. And I see this coalition pull together resources, and it's posted on your website. You're in the nexus of all this. So this time around, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, what's your read on the situation of peoples versus corporate power? This global coup d'etat that's been going on silently in so many different sectors um, has been advancing because there hasn't been enough information and knowledge about it. And also people haven't been connecting the dots to see this is happening in every sector. So what's really important this year, in, as, as, and I think it's particularly important in the wake of the pandemic, is that so many movements are coming together. Um, people's health movement has come together. A lot of groups involved in food sovereignty, uh, the trade union sector are coming together. They're all saying, uh, we do this. This is not in our name. Um, and of course, these are all groups that you'll never see in a in a in a multi-stakeholder initiative. Whenever they do have civil society partners, they don't involve people in the front lines. You won't find one health union worker in in the Covax initiative. You won't have public health people really represented. You represented so these are movements now starting to come together to say that we don't want this and one of the things we did was launch this letter it's an open letter and it's really saying that it's really alerting people to what's going on it's saying that we're, we're facing this in so many different sectors 
the UN is op is opening the door. The UN Secretary, I should say, is opening the door wide open uh, to the World Economic Forum, which is the key body advancing multi-stakeholderism, um, and and it's changing governance as we know it. It's and it has no systems of accountability or justice embedded in it. And these movements are now coming together to say we we we're, we're opposing this. We're uniting our forces, and, and we're going to fight back against this. And we know more than ever before with the pandemic that nationalist solutions to the global crisis will not work we need global cooperation we need global collaboration but if we hand over all that decision making to the pharmaceutical companies for example we won't be dealing with the real issues uh, of such as as trade protection and trips and I, um, patents and everything that that really benefit pharmaceutical companies and don't advance public health because they are in control of the process. They won't allow things that affect their profits. So we need global solutions, but they cannot be led by the corporations, which are actually worsening and deepening the crisis we face. So as we close, I just wanted to play a clip of a comment you made back in 2015, about a book you had co-edited uh, titled The Secure and The Dispossessed. I found a review of the book so relevant to our, our chat today. I, I just want to cite a few lines. It said, among the books that attempt to model the coming century, this one stands out for its sense of plausibility and danger. It examines several current trends in our responses to climate change, which if combined would result in a kind of oligarchic police state dedicated to extending capitalist hegemony. This will not work, and yet powerful forces are advocating for it rather than imagining and working for a more just, resilient, and democratic way forward. All the processes analyzed here are already happening now, making this book a crucial contribution to our cognitive mapping and our ability to form a better plan. So Nick, in wrapping up, briefly comment on that book, and then I'll play the clip. Yeah, back in 2011, we noticed a trend going on in terms of climate change where there was, was, was a lack of willingness to really tackle the climate crisis on the scale it needs and with the, with the, with the tools and instruments that it needs. But there was increasingly uh, plans by both um, the military and corporations for dealing with the impacts of climate change. Um, and they very much looked at it in terms of how do we secure the wealth of those and secure those who already have power and wealth um, and, and, and what that would mean. So in the face of climate crisis, the solution was very much a security solution. We've already seen really an increasing role of military and policing and security and a real process of militarization of responses to climate change, the most obviously in the area of the borders. We see, we see border walls going up everywhere. Um, the response to a crisis has been, has been to kind of retreat between, behind fortify, fortifications, no matter the consequences. Um, and so that that was really that's that's really a trend that we that we see increasingly is that climate our response to climate adaptation by the richest countries is really to militar to militarize our response to it, uh, and that's that's a and that's a real as as that quote you just read that's a real concern because um, it's a kind of politics of the armed lifeboat um, where basically you rescue a few and then you and then you have a gun trained on the rest. And it's, it's both totally immoral and it's also ultimately one that will uh, sacrifice all of our humanity because we need to collaborate to respond to the climate crisis. We need to find solutions that protect the vulnerable. We cannot just keep building higher and higher walls against the consequences of our decisions. And uh, we need to actually start to tackle the root causes of those crises. Um, and that, that was very much, uh, a picture we started to paint back in 2015 with the launch of the book, The Secure and the Dispossessed. But if anything, it's more pertinent and more pressing than ever before. Nick Buxton, thank you. Thanks. Keeping the profits, the huge profits rolling, um, even though it's wrecking the planet. So they have no intention long-term of changing their business model. Their business model is wrecking the planet 
and their determination is how to keep that going. And what we see in all of this is that corporations and the military are very much responding in a, in a paradigm of control, it's, it's security. And that this word security has suddenly infected every part of daily debate. We see it food security. We see it very recently now with everyone saying we need security of our borders to protect against refugees. We need water security. And in, in all of these cases, what you see is those who are being secured are the corporations and those who have wealth. And those who are losing out are those who are actually suffering the most from climate change. So the peasant who has their land grabbed in the name of food security, the community that no longer has control of their river because a corporation has, has taken it in the name of water security, or the protesters against coal power stations who are actually trying to stop the climate crisis being repressed um, and having their civil liberties taken away in the name of energy security. In each of these cases, the security is quite clearly for a small proportion of people and insecurity for the vast majority. I think this is one of the most important issues of our age is, is do we want to leave our future in the hands of corporations and the military?